Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Bright and early. We have a full house, although there are still seats all the way around the room here and there spattered. So those standing in the back, if you want to pop up, you can. Um, first of all, welcome to Clean Lakes Alliance. Alliance is Yahar Lakes 101 Lake Science Cafe. I'm Bob Weber. I'm president of First Weber and also serve on the community board for Clean Lakes Alliance. And along with the hosting sponsor, the Edgewire, the University of Wisconsin Nelson Institute for Environmental Studies and media partner, the Isthmus, and supporting sponsor, Johnson Bank. First Weber is proud to be the presenting sponsor of Yara Lakes 101 Lake Science Cafe. We wanted to quickly recognize businesses or organizations that became lake partners in the month of October. Uh, they joined a growing list of over 200 businesses or organizations that are supporting our lakes. A few quick announcements. First, our first ever Clean Lakes Community Awards will take place here at the Edgewater on Tuesday, the 27th. That's of this month. That will be at 3.30. We'll have networking, light appetizers, and a short program recognizing businesses and individuals who have made a difference this year. If you're a friend of Clean Lakes, uh, you can get a free ticket. To this event, check the tent papers on the tables, which would be, are they in front? I think in front of everybody here. Yep, there we are, right there. Um, that'll tell you how to register if you'd like to make the event. And second, there's more. We also have frozen assets. Uh, tickets are on sale, so don't miss Madison's most fashionable fundraiser. This year it's on Saturday, February 2nd. Tickets are currently early bird prices, but they will go up and they will sell out. So if you want to get to the frozen assets events, event, uh, get some tickets. If you'd like to volunteer to work our community uh, Frozen Assets Festival, we'd love to have you. You can contact uh, Maya to inquire. Her contact information is also on that tent paper at your table. So jump in there if you'd like to volunteer. And then lastly, what we're here for today is we're going to talk about the importance of urban leaf management. To tell us a little more about that topic and in introduce today's speaker, we have Colleen Johnson, and Colleen is from Johnson Financial Group. So please welcome Colleen to the podium. Thanks, Bob. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Um, as I mentioned, Colleen Johnson at Johnson Financial Group. It's same Johnson Bank, same organization, just enhancing our name to include all of our services. We have our wealth area, our banking service, obviously, and insurance. So uh, same, same organization. We've um, been great, proud supporters of the speaker series over the last year. And uh, we are glad to also uh, announce that we'll be supporters next year. So we're, we're very excited to be a part of this. <laughs> and as, uh, as Bob said today, our theme today, our, our topic is urban leaf management. And uh, why is this important? Well, we all love our trees, right? Love our trees, trees have leaves, and when the leaves fall, they become um, the major source of nutrient pollution to our lakes. And how does this happen? If you aren't familiar with that process, just a real brief, and thanks for the notes, I'm a financial planner, not a biologist. But <laughs> <laughs> uh, so the reason, you know, when, leaves, when the leaves fall, they collect in our streets, and when storm water passes through them, they act like a tea bag. The leaf there then becomes a phosphorus but the phosphorus nutrient is washed from the storm water into the storm sewers and directly into our lakes. So it's a little bit about how it happens, but I'm sure we're going to learn a lot more about that. Um, the City of Madison and the United States Geological Survey uh, have been conducting a research project for the last five years to quantify impacts of leaf management on water quality and how you, me, all of us can help. Presenting on this topic is Phil Gabler, a water resources engineer for the city of Madison. Uh, Phil focuses primarily on ways to reduce the impact of stormwater on the lakes and streams near Madison. His work includes designing green infrastructure, detention basins, and innovative treatment technologies. So please join me in welcoming Phil Gabler. Thank you. Everyone, 
and volume. So, as Colleen just said, I'm Bill Gabler, I work for the city of Madison, and you know, this picture kind of illustrates the problem at some level uh, if we just add rain, right? These leaves right now are really not causing any problems, but when we rain on top of those, all of a sudden our street, which looks kind of cool with all these leaves on it, becomes a major source of phosphorus, and I'm going to go through kind of why that happens. When I've talked about this in the past, a lot of people be like, haven't there been leaves for a long, long time, and we didn't have lakes that were filled with algae before, what, what's happened, right? So if you look at what our Wisconsin landscape looked like about 200 years ago, we had a lot of oak trees, we have this really dense understory because the oaks allow enough light to get through and you have a lot of plants, an oak savanna. And when it rains on this, almost all of the water goes down into the ground. And if you have your fall leaf litter, right, those leaves will leach that phosphorus out and it goes right into the ground. And soil is really good at binding up phosphorus and the plants are scavenging some of that phosphorus. And so there's a really tight loop, right? The roots bring the phosphorus up, turns it into leaves, it falls back down, it fertilizes the roots of the trees, and not that much phosphorus goes into the lakes. Unless your leaves are falling right next to a stream or right next to the lake. Or you have a big, a really, really big event. But then we came along and said, well, we want to have houses and roads and sidewalks everywhere. And when you have that, you increase your impervious area and you get a lot more runoff. So, well, we have a solution to that. Civil engineers to the rescue yet again. And we put in storm drains and sanitary sewers. Now, the sanitary sewer here goes to the wastewater treatment plant, and then it's Bad Fish Creek. So it doesn't impact our lakes. But on the storm drain, which is the right side here, we have water that flows off of our landscape and goes into these drains on the street. And then we have the street has runoff also. You add trees, you then get leaves on your street. It doesn't take much rain at all for those leaves to get wet enough to release their phosphorus. That phosphorus is leached into the water, it goes to the storm drain directly to the lakes. So we've essentially expanded the, the edge of the lake and the edge of the streams throughout the entire city. So now someone who used to live miles from the lake and it would have taken a long time for phosphorus to go in this cycle down, 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 so it gets the lake, have a direct conduit. They essentially have lakefront property from what the lake is feeding. And just to kind of show how this process looks now, we have leaves on the street on the left, and then we get a rainstorm. A lot of those leaves are still there. The leaf doesn't have to leave the street. And if you collect the water in the pipe, you end up with this leaf tea. It really doesn't have much sediment in it, but it has all the tannins. It's, it looks like tea that you would drink, and it has a lot of high, a lot of dissolved phosphorus. We go back and think, well, why do we care about this phosphorus? I think most of the people in this room understand why we care about phosphorus, and we have our Rock River watershed, of which Madison is a small little part of, right up here, and. We have regulations that we're trying to reduce the amount of phosphorus that comes through this whole system. And then having high phosphorus loads also uh, helps to spur plant growth. And we get all this excessive weed that we have the, the weed cutters out there, algae, things that make the lake not so nice. And then it also can increase the risk of having a blue-green algae bloom. And that's a picture that I took of the Yahara River up at the top. Uh, that has not been doctored. It looked like blue paint. It was kind of shocking to see and really uh, glad that it doesn't happen that frequently, but it, it's a rough one. That killed quite a few aquatic species. So if you look at where Madison was at five years ago or even two years ago, we spent a lot of money on our leaf collection. $2.3 million as a matter of fact. And we collect a lot of leaves from our landscape, 16,000 tons. When you think about uh, a semi holding maybe 16 tons, that's a lot of trips in that semi from the streets and throughout the city to the composting facility. 
we currently have the ability to apply for some phosphorus credits. Before we started this process, we were given zero credits towards those federal and state goals for all of our effort, right? So your return on investment of $2.3 million is a cleaner city but and, and happier residents. But we didn't get anything from the water quality perspective because we didn't really know what we were getting. So we worked really hard to quantify that. Uh, with the USGS and the help of uh, Roger Bandman, who I see in the back of the room here, uh, our expert citizen scientist and volunteer, and USGS and DNR employee at different phases throughout this project, and we quantified a reduction. And now we can get a 40% reduction for our leaf management efforts in Madison. I'm going to talk a little bit now about the, the, just the structure of the study, and then we're going to get into actions to help maybe go above that 40%. So this was a paired basin study, and this is a way to compare things that are always in flux, right? We, don't, we can't have the same rainfall every year, and so we need to measure both of our basins. We have a control where we don't do anything, and then we have one where we test. And if you have one year where you do treat both of the basins the same, and then you change one of them the next year, you can run the statistics, uh, Bill Selvig at the USGS did all that for us, which I was thankful for. And you can see if there is a difference between your test and your control. It's also important to go through and like quantify all the parameters of your test area. And one of the major drivers here was the canopy cover. And so we quantified the canopy cover both on people's yards and the trees hanging over the street and looked at and we mapped all the trees and we looked at the species of the trees. We have very, very high canopy cover here in each one of these basins. So we know we have a really big leaf contribution. But they're relatively close except for gray fox is a little bit of an outlier. And the results you're going to see are from the two on the left where we had Yellowstone and Kenosha, a 45 and a 60% canopy cover total. And the street cover is right about 17%. So if we go through and we measure the phosphorus that was coming out of the pipe in these basins. This is, this is our Kenosha and Yellowstone, and this is the year we did nothing, right? We didn't collect leaves at all. Uh, we just let them accumulate on the street until right about now. You see we, through April to September, we had a little low level phosphorus bouncing around, and then we hit the leaf fall, and things increased dramatically. We went from 0.5, all the way up to 3.5 uh, milligrams per liter. Really, really dramatic increase. So, all right, well, what could we do to reduce that? What if we take all the leaves off of the street before every storm? That was something that we knew we could not translate to the rest of the city. But if we couldn't see that change between the do nothing and the escalated management, we knew it was time to just cancel the study and go home and save everybody a bunch of money. So, for escalated management, we did our standard weekly, or we did our standard collection. We made it be a weekly collection. We then went through with a street sweeper, and then our friends and collaborators at the USGS went out before every rainstorm with leaf blowers and cleaned the street perfectly. Right? This is not something we're going to do everywhere, but <laughs> there's a lot of people that would like it if we would. But it gives you a pretty nice clean street. And when you look at before and after, you're like, who wouldn't want to have that nice street for a brand? <laughs> you saw what this looks like now, you'd be shocked. Because we have done no collection there this year. Uh, so let, uh, what does that do for our results? We compare our old uh, chart to now our new chart. We can see that we had a huge drop, that dashed line at the bottom. You can see we went back almost to the like the leaves weren't there. We're like, this is amazing. So we dug into the details some more and found that if we looked before where we did the do nothing, the fall load is that yellow piece of the pie. 60% this year, 60% of the phosphorus for the entire year happened in the eight storms that fall. We then push that look at Kenosha, where we had the escalated management, where the street was perfectly clean before every rainstorm, 16% was the fast contribution. That is a nearly 80% reduction. It's, it 
I was amazed that this could happen. Another thing to look at here is what is the type of phosphorus? Phosphorus comes really in two forms. You have phosphorus that's bound onto sediment, and you have phosphorus that is dissolved just like sugar and water. And the sugar and water phosphorus is a lot harder to catch because we use acetylene and detention basins to capture that sediment-bound phosphorus. And you usually say, well, it's too hard to get the dissolved phase phosphorus. We'll let that go through. If you're in the spring, right, and you catch all of your sediment, you're getting a 65% reduction in your phosphorus load. But if it's the fall, and 85% of our phosphorus is already dissolved, even if you capture all of the sediment, which is nearly impossible, you still have, you only get 15% of your phosphorus. So this really drives how, and we'll talk about this, how we we're going to think about treating leaves and managing leaves and, and what our options are. So we kind of go through and like put this on the chart. We have no collection. Our current collection options, right? We tested that as well. Um, that gave us a 40% reduction. And then we have this enhanced collection, which is an 80% reduction. Now when I say our, our kind of current collection, this is what everyone in this, well, if you live in, if you live in the city of Madison, it's what everyone in this room experiences where you have a little pusher come out and pushes your leaves off the street about every two weeks, pushes them into the back of a old garbage truck, and then within 48 hours, we have a street sweeper come through and clean up the street, or if it's rained recently, mash it into a little bit of a leaf paste and get most of the leaves off the street. It doesn't look the cleanest, but it is doing quite a bit of good. So we decided, well, in 2000, this was 2016 we were here, in 2017 we said, well, we're going to look at the standard collection and add in uh, vacuums, and we're going to do just a vacuum trial as well. So when I say a vacuum trial, I don't mean your normal shop vac at your house. I'm talking about, this is not the one we use, this is Monona's. They have a large truck with this boom arm that comes over and they suck all the leaves off. And then you can follow that up with a weekly sweeping as well. We also did what we call our standard operating procedure plus, and this is where we did push them into the streets. And then we're gonna come through every week with a vacuum cleaner and pick up the leaves that have fallen in that in-between week. If you wanna see how this vacuum sweeper uh, impacts the leaves, these are photos that I took. We went out before every rainstorm and took pictures of the curb line so we could quantify the mass of leaves on the street. And we, on the upper left, we have, what was that like on the fifth? Then the sweeper came through. That looks pretty good. It's almost as good as our escalated uh, collection. But then I went back in the ninth and I was like, huh, we have a lot of leaves back in the street because leaves keep falling, as a homeowner will, will know, right? Like, I don't know if we're going to see any sort of an impact. It might, it might be too noisy in the data. We won't see that this vacuum effort is worth anything at all. But we ran all the statistics and we ran a bunch of other tests. And if you line them all up and compare them, you can see that. On the far left, we have our escalated technique for every storm. 80% reduction in your phosphorus. Look at our standard approach we're doing right now, you get 40. And then both of these other two things we tried last year, kind of split the uprights, and we're right at 60%. Like, well, that rarely happens. <laughs> this, is, this is a nice surprise to see this level of reduction for a pretty incremental increase. And it seemed almost linear. And it, I, was, I was shocked to see these results, and I was like, all right, it's time to make, we can make some changes and, and work towards that 60% as our goal. So just a quick little recap here. If the year that we did our study, 60% of the phosphorus came from the fall. That was that pie chart. Almost all of the fall phosphorus is dissolved, which means that a detention basin is not going to do very much to stop it. And then we also learned with our, you know, tracking the leaf accumulation in the street, that the release of the phosphorus is directly tied to the mass of the leaves in the street. Like, all right, we know a lot more information about leaves than five years ago when we started. What can we do to make a change? So if we look at our options for change. We can treat the stormwater differently. 
right? We can try to infiltrate more of the water, which has all sorts of additional benefits. We can try to put some form of a filter onto our certain our existing treatment devices, right? There's things out there that can filter out dissolved phosphorus. This is a lot. It's a nice place, uh, not like <laughs> a lot nicer place to be than with chloride, where there aren't really chloride filters, right? And then we can add chemicals which will bind up the phosphorus and settle it out, right? Good and bad with all these. We also can reduce the source. We learn a lot about tree species mix, citizen action, and we can change the way we collect things as a municipality. So we build your rain gardens quickly, right? They treat the water year round. You get a sediment reduction. You're gonna let that water act like more like its natural oak savanna ecosystem. Uh, you have pollinator habitat, and the dissolved phosphorus can come in, get bound up in the soil, become food for your plants. Problem is that these really don't treat that much area. Right? 10 to 1 ratio, so if you have a 150 square foot garden, you get 1,500 square feet of road. We have a lot of road. This is a long-term solution to the problem. Right? It takes a long time to build enough rain gardens that we would reduce that phosphorus load, and they require a lot of maintenance, and they're sensitive to salt. Right? Salt might cause these to fail. Just something to put out there. If you'd like a rain garden to get your street redone, it's a good place, a uh, good chance that we can help you out. I talked about these phosphorus filters. So this is a study out of uh, Minnesota. They have tried to ring their detention basins with sand that has iron in it. And the iron, very similar to the bottom of the lakes, binds up phosphorus. The problem with these is that if that lake or that uh, detention basin stays high for too long, you have a year like this year, where we had 65 inches of rain as opposed to our normal 30, and we had days upon days upon days of rain. The phosphorus that gets bound in these filters on the side of your detention basins just re-releases. You're like, well, you just spent a lot of time, money, and effort to temporarily hold this phosphorus. There's other ways you can go, right? You could uh, use aluminum oxides and bind this a little more permanently. Cost benefit ratios are, you know, it takes a while. These also filter pretty slow. You have to have contact time. So you're looking at a lot of area and a lot of expense to try to grab enough of this dissolved phosphorus. But these are things we're looking at as well. The other one is this uh, using chemicals. This is my uh, backyard uh, science project with uh, my kid. I was showing him how uh, Alan works. And that water on the left was sitting there for a week. This is from my coworker's backyard. She clearly has a lot of clay in her yard. Shook it up. I then added alum. I added a little bit too much alum. A little cloudy, but that dropped out in about 20 minutes. And as it falls, it collects a lot of this dissolved phosphorus. This has other ramifications. You know, like we've piloted a few projects here. If you try to treat a detention basin, it takes a lot of mechanical, a lot of pumps, a lot of monitoring. You have to kind of baby this that system to get it to work. If you're doing alum, there's some concerns just that you're adding a chemical, you're going to change the pH. There's some risk that the part of that could methylate mercury, which makes it more bioavailable. Things that we have to be conscientious of and balance our risk with our, our benefit here. But, it is a tool that's out there, and I think it can be used effectively. There's also other coagulants that use aluminum, and that's what we're looking at for the Starkweather Creek project, where we have an old, an old quarry that we could use as a treatment device and possibly inject a, an alum coagulant that would capture a lot of sediment and phosphorus. And it might be the, one of the few ways to get this dissolved phosphorus. So that's kind of our treatment end. Now if we look at how do we control the source. This slide shocked me. I'm like, well, isn't a leaf a leaf? Apparently not. We have an order of magnitude difference between the different species of trees that we have out there and how much phosphorus they leach out. Now this study was put a bunch of leaves in a beaker, shake it up, let it sit for a while, pour it out, measure the phosphorus, right? Not exactly your street condition, but 
If you look at sugar maple, which just happens to be the highest percentage of canopy throughout the entire city, yeah. unfortunately, and our state tree. Uh, <laughs> we, uh, it has a lot of phosphorus that we use about. If only weepy willows were a great street tree, <laughs> I might not be here. <laughs> we wouldn't really worry about this. But there's a huge, a huge uh, difference. And you're like, all right, well, what if we just replace all of our ash trees, which are dying anyway, with little leaf linden? You get a 46% reduction in your phosphorus load just from that, provided that this research is 100% valid and works in the street and all those other assumptions. You know, but when we talk to our forestry department, they're like, well, we've done monocultures in the past, and it didn't work out so well. We're actually paying the penalty for that right now that we overplanted ash trees and the elms, right? We, we need to be able to have a diverse canopy, but maybe we can be a little more uh, judicious in the way that we select our trees. Now we get to, to you guys, so we have citizen actions, right? We have, let's put our leaves in the right spot. When we put our leaves in the terrace, that grass area between the curb and the sidewalk, not that much phosphorus actually gets into our lakes. When we rake the leaves before the storm, which I know is a lot of effort, you can get close to that escalated level of treatment. We can use our leaves as a resource. We can compost them on site. And if you don't want to use a compost pile, you can use your lawnmower and you can mow over your leaves, especially when it's early in the season. So, can anyone tell me what's wrong with this picture on the left? <laughs> Why did I put a big X through that uh, pile of leaves? So someone put all of their leaves off of their precious grass into the street. Now this was in our study area, right? They had received letters from me, which maybe they're in the pile. I don't know. <laughs> they were. There's a, a little bit of frustration that happens when we tell our residents that we're not going to collect leaves until Thanksgiving. I get it. <laughs> this was frustrating to see. And now I have a nice example picture because there are a lot of people outside of the study who didn't know that also do this because they don't want the grass to die. And when we did our follow up survey, we asked people, like, what can we change to make leaf collection better for you and have you follow the rules? They're like, how about you tell us where you're at in the leaf collection process and when you're going to be at my house? And so we've made a few changes, baby steps, right? We got street names on our maps. If you look at our leaf collection maps, you may have noticed that they're, you can read where you're at. We have these big blocks at the city. The street department says, well, we've been here. We're going to be here next. But it's not that clear. Um, we're going to enter the... 20th century this year and uh, add GPS to our leaf collection equipment and our street sweepers. And this will give us a lot more information and I think we'll be able to track where we've been and then all of our residents can extrapolate where we're going to be in the near future. So we don't want the left, we want the right. This one, we're closer, right? We are not in violation of the City of Madison ordinance. Uh, so we can't find the person on the left $50, nor would we go out and do that. But they missed the most important leaves, right? They did everything, or 95% right, but then they left that little tiny curb line for another two minutes of work. You could have a curb that looks like the one on the right and have a dramatic reduction in the phosphorus load. Now, mulching and composting can get kind of messy. Our buddy on the left here is using face shield, earmuffs, you know, it's a major operation. You also can just mow your leaves in your lawn. I did that last year, uh, and I mowed all of my leaves, and I ended up with a five-gallon bucket of leaf powder, essentially, that I put on my garden, and it disappeared because it had been so ground up. Worked all right. If you have a lot of leaves, which I know some of our residents do, we've been out taking pictures of leaves and met with homeowners that had a pile of leaves five feet high, the entire terrace, all right? I'm not asking that person to mulch all of their leaves. But the great thing about mulching is you get a lot of compounding benefits. Your grass and your turf and your soil will be healthier. 
you know, from the city perspective, we don't have to transport those leaves, take them to the compost facility, let them compost it, and then let everybody buy it back for, you know, $8 a bag. Uh, and if everyone was composting the majority of their leaves, we might be able to get that collection cycle up from two weeks in the middle of the, two or even three weeks in the middle of leaf fall down to a one week frequency. On the municipal side, right, maybe there's a way we can do that uh, off week leaf removal just in the street. We can either use a, a vacuum street sweeper, right, which works quite well. I showed that picture, like it gets the leaves off. It's not that big. It doesn't really chop up the leaves. And these things are really expensive. That is a house. That's $250,000 for one street sweeper. They last about five years and they require maintenance every year. Right? It's a pretty specialized and impressive piece of equipment, but maybe we don't need something quite that amazing. Maybe we can do a nearly as good job with a $2,000 lawnmower and a $1,000 attachment on the back. Right? And maybe we can use that to facilitate our collection in a more efficient manner. There's the other side here where maybe we need to get to, uh, and I was talking with James about this earlier today. Cars are an obstacle. If we can move the cars, we can run the street sweeper down the curb line and get all those leaves, or a lawnmower, or an army of lawnmowers. Uh, maybe we need to make some policy changes on where we allow people to park. <coughs> Another thing we looked at was switching to bagging. Right? Madison used to bag all the leaves. Right? So we, uh, we implemented a study. We asked two neighborhoods to bag all of their leaves. One, we said, the uh, bag delivery team is here. Here's your bundle of bags. And we sell them up. Uh, other ones, we asked people to go out and find their bags and, and purchase them and put them, do the same thing. People were much more willing if they were given bags to, uh, <laughs> to participate. And a lot of people, like 95% of the people, I think, in the one neighborhood where we gave bags, went through the effort to fill. It's some work. There's some cost. It, some homes clearly need a lot of bags. I think this home had about 80 bags. You know, part of this was it's some inefficient filling, but it's, it's a lot of bags either way. <laughs> and then you see that if we, we assess this leaf accumulation and Although we didn't measure it in of pipe water quality, we can see there were less leaves on the street. It, bagging does work at some levels, but we also had a pretty engaged and educated neighborhood here working on this. Um, if we look at how much we think this could cost each household, it's somewhere around five, five to ten dollars probably. Uh, and our streets department is a little bit apprehensive about it because you can't see in that bag. And their, their uh, level of accepting a new idea oftentimes starts with the lowest 3% of society. Like, who's going to put a bowling ball in here just for fun? Who's going to hide the things that they can't throw away normally? I think we can get past that, but uh, it, is a, it is a hindrance. So a lot of this comes down to just raking, in my mind, where we're at right now, the, I think the biggest thing that someone can do is to go out and rake your curb line. Just like that escalated model, if we can do that before the rainstorms, we get the most return on our investment. If I could ask people to do one thing for phosphorus reductions to light, this is it. And we've set up a text alert system where you can sign up, and my, one of the people in, at the county will send a text message to you and say, it is, uh, it's gonna rain in the next 24 hours. If you have time, rake your leaves. Now we've tried this this year. We've gotten quite a few people that have signed up and they're doing this. And I got some tough to answer emails. I had people take a picture of their street. I'm like, do you really expect me to rake this, <laughs> and it had rained, it was wet, all the ash trees 
dropped all the leaves at the same time. There was a half inch thick carpet across the entire street of stuck on wet leaves. I was like, I know that's a big ass. Since we know that the mass is related to the delivery of the phosphorus, every leaf you get is the same, right? You don't have to get all the leaves. So I'm asking, you know, bear with us. We're working on, on improving this collection, but if you just want to get two or three feet off the curve line, that's fine. The text alert is not supposed to riddle you with guilt. It's supposed to give you a friendly reminder that if you want to optimize your efforts, now is a good day to do it. So I think you know, it's a really powerful tool. Take it for what it's worth and know that every leaf you get is a benefit. It doesn't have to be perfect. And with that, I'll take questions. I'm just going to walk the microphone around. People have questions, so if you want to raise your hand, I'm going to go around and give it to the first person I see. Do you have any information about surrounding communities? Because our storm sores come from other than Madison, and I'm sure they're a significant contribution. Do you share your information, and are other communities participating? Uh, yes, so we do have information on other communities, and this was a part of it. A larger outreach as we were getting these great results we uh, reached out to I don't know how many communities throughout the state of Wisconsin people or communities over 10,000 people and asked them what they do we have people that do vacuum collection Madison's kind of unique in their grooming approach we also have communities that essentially do one pickup and ask residents to push their leaves into the street for the entire year and that's kind of your worst case scenario and we're hoping that with this information, people will turn the tide and change that behavior, and they now have a, a financial benefit of doing so. Um, in our neighboring, like the Hara Lakes watershed, we have a shared permit for our storm sewers, and we've shared this presentation, we've talked to them. Middleton has done research projects, we've worked with Fitch Fitchburg, and you know the message We've, we've tried to have a cohesive message, and that uh, the text alerts is one of the outreach components of that uh, permit group. Did that answer your question? It did. Uh, one follow up is yeah, a follow up would be you text people who ask you to text them, correct? Yes. Any consideration of doing it the other way? <laughs> that's a tough sell for uh, the education and outreach component of, of our group, right? People that don't, you know, we don't have everyone's phone number. <laughs> it's a little hard for us to justify using kind of the reverse 911 emergency Amber Alert system for leaves. Uh, so I think now we're going to stick with uh, volunteers and we'll, we'll just try to get as many people that are conscientious of this into the fold as possible. I like where your head's at. I'm going to move this mic down a little bit. All right, I'm ready. Okay, on the uh, slide that you had on uh, the different tree species uh, and uh, the amount of phosphorus in the leaves, uh, did you do any testing on uh, uh, evergreens? Uh, um, pine needles, uh, uh, are, do they contain as much phosphorus as uh, some of the species that you showed there? And then secondly, have you done any random testing of uh, uh, the uh, our soil tests uh, around uh, Madison here to determine the amount of phosphorus uh, in the soil? Those are great questions. On the evergreen side, we have not looked at evergreens. Um, usually those don't make it out to the curb, and we don't have or we have very, very few illicit evergreens in our terrace. You know, the forestry department doesn't like them there. Uh, every once in a while, one gets to stay. And then we, uh, as far as the soil testing, we've talked about this in our group as to, is that a driving force to the amount of phosphorus in the leaf, right? If you have really phosphorus-starved soil, is 
the tree going to not push as much phosphorus into its leaves? And we have not done that soil testing yet, but it is one of those variables we looked at, and things compound pretty quickly when you start wondering where that phosphorus is coming from. But Roger has a hand up, and he might be telling you that I'm wrong. It's a good question. We've done a lot of testing with soils around Madison, people's front yards, backyards. Very heavy in phosphorus. Um, it's one of the reasons why I want to do the work though, on the reduction of phosphorus and fertilizer, because there's so much phosphorus already in our soils. I won't know why, but lawns can actually reduce, produce a lot of phosphorus, but don't get much runoff. That's why the leaves of the street are so important. Okay, the Yohara Clean Plan says we need to get 4,000 pounds of additional <coughs> phosphorus from leaf management. That's the number one urban uh, phosphorus reduction uh, goal. Do you think that's realistic now? I mean, we're going to be looking at maybe um, analyzing all these different options and based on all this research, and what you think could be achieved and that's just not this Madison and all the other communities. Do you think 4,000 pounds additional from what it used to be is a realistic goal? So I get, we get to time with everybody in the Yohara watershed? Yeah, it's all urban. So it's not just Madison. I, I think you could get close to 4,000. And it depends on if we're looking at actual phosphorus from a reduction. By your middle of the road <coughs> efforts, like you. Yeah, the 60% reduction. Yeah. Um, I think you could. I, it's, it's from a, from the regulatory perspective, right? The way that the, the guidance has come through, it's pretty limited in scope right now. But a lot of that is to match exactly what we did in the study. And there may be a way to kind of expand where we would think we'd have these same results based on canopy coverage throughout the whole watershed. And then we'd have a little better handle on that number. But my gut feeling is that there's 4,000 pounds of leaf phosphorus out there. Roger, I don't know, I can put you, I don't need, need to put you in a spot, but I think that's about, it, it, feel, it doesn't feel wrong to me. Four thousand is a lot. Yeah. Okay. Question. This seems like an activity where um, neighborhood and citizen participation would really be effective. Effective. Um, I know that when I rank the curb, I sometimes rank my neighbor's curb also. So that um, that encourages. I mean, he's he's incentivized then to also rank up his leaves, and sometimes he'll do mine if he sees there's curb when uh, he's in the curb. Have you worked through the neighborhood associations to challenge them to uh, to get their their members to uh, sort of make this a ethical thing or an ethic thing in the uh, that everybody does it in our neighborhood? So we have. Uh, I actually gave a very condensed ten minute version of this presentation to the the Sassy neighborhood, the Shank Atwood. I just got the last one. Starkweather Yara uh, neighborhood and. They, they were excited about it. I didn't see a huge amount of the outreach that we were hoping, and it was, you know, the presentation was a little lightly attended, but there's motivation to do that. And we're gonna, if we look at the Warren Lagoon, that's one of our other target areas, because we haven't really pushed in that neighborhood on leaves yet. And so we can help to refine our message and outreach and see if we can make a change. And one of the great things we did with this project is not only measure the, do the expensive measuring of the phosphorus at the end of the pipe, but also to take pictures of the leaves on the street and try to correlate those two. And it gives you a really inexpensive way to go out and assess whether or not what you've asked people to do resulted in a change. And you can go through and say, look, 
when we before we were here, we were having piles of leaves in the street and a lot of leaf accumulation, and now we're down by this quantifiable number. And so you can kind of say, well, I think that's this many pounds of phosphorus. Good job. So we're working on that. Uh, the flooding kind of put a wrench in that for me this year, because they locked me in a room for about three weeks and said, Phil, you're going to help distribute sandbags. And that was right in the prime time for leaf outreach. The uh, lens of light comments out. Um, what are the thoughts as to how it initiated Um, my question is about how do we quantify that? Then what we're going to end up with is the number of pounds of leaves that are matched with the compost, or it does like ten to one. So we, we're going to end up with a number that's like truckloads, pounds of leaves. We don't really have the SOP that the Madison system has because there's no sweeping involved at all. It's just vacuuming up the leaves. So are we at like the forty percent end? Or are we even lower than that because we don't have any sweeping going on in between? Do you have curb and gutter? Or is it, uh, uh, do you have swales? Half of the lake has curb and gutter, and it goes into the storm system. That's the south side of the lake. The north side of the lake actually doesn't have storm sewage. But we're just trying to get everybody around that lake into the mentality of get your leaves up and put them on your grass or so, I, th I think it comes with yours, it comes down to the frequency that there's collection. And if they're cleaning the curb line and getting the leaves off of the edge of the street, that curb and the leaves on the street are very, very important. And a lot of times, the leaves get pushed over. So as your vacuum person is coming through, they're picking up both the, the curb and the terrace. That's really important. I think if you're there at a two-week frequency, you're probably close to this 40%. But if you want to assess that, you can talk with me and we can go through the, the photo documentation that you would do as you go through and say, it was going to rain on this day and I, I took these pictures and I've scored this a one through a five and that's related to a certain amount of pounds. And now that we're doing this vacuuming, we're at a much lower level. I think you could, you can get up that ballpark quantification that way. Thanks for taking that on, Phil, because that's a grant deliverable requirement. So I appreciate you helping out. My question is Does the city have regulations for how the professional uh, landscape management companies handle their leaves? So you cannot, per ordinance, dump in the street or in a greenway. Um, if you pile your leaves into the street, that's, I think it's a $50 fine. Um, we, however, don't have the leaf police out cruising the streets looking for violators. It's usually a complaint-driven uh, ticket. So there are rules that guide that. Um, I will say that I have seen a lot of the landscaping companies out there being incredible partners in this, where they will mow the lawn, even with their leaves, and they go back and go out to the center line of the street with their leaf blower and blow everything back onto the lawn that they just cleaned up. I've been impressed with that. Uh, not everyone's a good actor, though, and there are rules about not dumping there. And if anyone, anyone asks you if it's okay to dump your leaves in the greenway, the answer is no. Uh, we still get that, and we get people that say like, "Oh, I mold stuff; it's fine." Like, it's not fine. Hi, I just wanted to mention that the city of Monona has an adopt a stormwater drain program, sort of like adopt a highway to pick up litter, which might be a really good. And I think that, that gets close. Uh, I would say that it could be adapt a curb and a gutter, or a, a curb and an inlet, because it's that mass of leaves. And if you just get the leaves right around the edge, A, those have probably released most of their phosphorus, and B, you're only getting a small percentage. But it's, it's a good way, good start. Uh, I was wondering, following up on the, your outreach to the communities, do you um, work with the landlords? The city has more and more rental properties now, and as a former landlord, I know the tenants don't break. So I'm just wondering if that's part of our regulation for the rental properties. We have not targeted rental properties from a leaf perspective. I've focused on them more from a salt perspective, and trying to get the contractors that do winter maintenance. That's a different, a different hat, a different speech for a different day. But 
adding them to the leaf uh, outreach is, uh, is a good idea. Yeah. So I've got a couple of questions for you. So um, one, you have this great graph of saying what type of trees. If we actually calculated what percentage of our trees in Madison are sugar maple, and so would we put together a 25 year plan to uh, go from uh, what percentage of sugar, excuse me, what percentage of sugar maple, which ones are pine oak, Chinese elm, and are we gonna try to, is there, is there a talk about trying to reduce the amount of trees with high phosphorus, even we can still have a blend, but maybe instead of having, you know, 95% sugar maple, we could go down to 50% sugar maple, maple. So I think we're at about 25% sugar maple for our street trees. And at a city level, we have a really good handle of what is planted in the terrace, right? In 2012, that was, they were all marked and measured. And so we know how big they are and where, where they are and, and what species they are. When we get into someone's yard, <clears throat> It's a monumental effort to try to go through and quantify that. And we did that for this. We went through and measured every tree and did the species. One really cool piece of technology that could solve this problem for us <clears throat> is LiDAR, which is a flyover with a laser that bounces off of the ground and we can use it to get elevations. And if you pay a little extra money, you can get someone to process that and they can tell you the species of the tree with some level of confidence. And Milwaukee did this to quantify the percentage of ash trees in the entire watershed. It came back to like, well, on average, we're at 19, we have these pockets of really, really dense in ash trees. And so based on the research we did, we said it's important for us to have a canopy layer, <clears throat> know how much canopy coverage we have and know what those are. So we're actually gonna contract that out next year. That's in the budget, I think. I didn't, I think they just got approved last night. And I didn't confirm that it's still in there, but it was in the budget as of yesterday. I have a question about you, you're at a 40% credit and trying to get it higher. Exactly what does that mean? What kind of credit? Do you get money back or credit toward phosphorus reduction or what does that mean? So these, when I say credit, it's a credit towards a phosphorus reduction. So if we look at the total maximum daily load of phosphorus that comes out of our watershed, which is uh, where the kind of federal and state regulations come through. Madison needs to have about, a, the city of Madison, about a 14,000 pound reduction per year of phosphorus. And the leaf credits, we we're gonna to count towards that. And we're part of, you know, with the Ahara winds and the adaptive management approach to getting at the 106,000 pounds of phosphorus to take out of the Ahara watershed. That's Madison's portion of it. And we're kind of working within those mechanisms to say, here's how much we're gonna pay in to have farmers do practices on their fields, and here's what we're gonna do inside of city limits. That yeah. answered? Uh, when we're back to the tree species, some of those don't lose their leaves until the spring, like the pin oaks, and we were talking about doing it one leaf collection um, after those kind of trees drop their leaves in the spring. Is that part of your little bump in April May in the phosphorus? Hmm. Is that a good idea? I, I think in our, in the watersheds where we were doing our study, right, we're limited to what we, what we measured, I don't think there were many pin oaks or spring leaf drop trees. Uh, most of that was from, and if we come back, you can even see a little bit on the top here, it's not the best, but if you look here and this one, you can see that we get a little bit of it's the bud drop that we think is causing that, that spike. More than the leaves. More than the, more than the leaves. And there's a lot of oaks in this watershed, but they all, they're all white oaks that drop their leaves in the fall. One more, a little more research creep. <laughs> I promise everybody in, the, in these study areas that this was actually the last year after we've extended it, so we're going to have to do this somewhere else, or they might actually come down to the city and get rid of me. A big round of applause for Phil and all the good work.
my uh, two takeaways from this was one, if you think about Madison in the 70s and the little amount of recycling that happened in our city, we just had newspapers that you would tie up with twine uh, and now you've gone all the way to the point that you your kitchen drawer pulls out, you have recycling, non-recycling, you have a whole new system of trucks that come to your home to pick up the trash, you have new trash cans, and we've come a long way. And I think we're at the beginning of a, a, a cultural shift on what we do with the leaves and how we build out our landscaping around our homes. And you know, it's us as citizens is, is the way to make that change and start by uh, moving forward. Secondly, uh, you are seeing a, a greater coordination between the different communities. We are working, uh, going to what uh, Senator Mark Miller was talking about, is that you know one brand, one slogan, one photograph, and so the photograph that's used by the city of Madison for Leaf Street Streets is the same one that's down on the Kiganza, it's the same one that we're using on Tim Lakes Alliance Media. So that coordination helps from municipality to municipality uh, so I woke up this morning and I talked to someone, what, what's tomorrow? Does anybody know what tomorrow is? November 15th. Anybody? Alternate, Alternate side, side street parking. So what if we would start that on October 1st? Have you ever walk, gone down the street and looked at the, the poor guys who are driving the street sweepers are going around that one car and they leave the leaves that goes around like that. So what if we just bump that back from November 15th back to October 1st. Everybody does it anyways. It's gonna be a lot easier to pick up trash. It's gonna be a lot easier to pick up the leaves. You don't have to go around that. So Bill's gonna move it up the, the, the chain. I think we're gonna start advocating for that. It would make all of our lives easier. And I think the you know, street sweepers are out there. They just can't get to some of the, you know, the cars because the leaves are in the way. Uh, so that is our, this is our final uh, your Higher Lakes 101 for the year. So I'd like to again thank Johnson Bank, uh, First Weber, and all of our other supporters, including the Edgewater Hotel, for your Higher Lakes 101. Uh, we have our Phoenix Awards coming up uh, on Tuesday, November 27th. And we're really excited uh, that the, both the city of Madison and the county passed their budgets, budgets this week. Uh, both have a lot of new initiatives uh, and dollars from uh, education programs, uh, new uh, stormwater work, new pilots going on for uh, Suck the Muck, along with a lot of another initiative. So uh, through all your advocacy and informing the project, uh, informing the public, we're moving things forward. So I'd like to thank all of you for Getting more informed because now you guys are going to go and talk leaves all Thanksgiving weekend with your <laughs> relatives, and uh, we hope to see leaf uh, clean streets over the Thanksgiving weekend. Thank you very much, and have a great day.